welcome to Live at 7 here on CVM TV. It is Tuesday, August 5. Thanks for watching here in Jamaica and online at CVMTV.com. I'm Simon Crosskill. Now then, this evening we examine the life and work of a remarkable Jamaican who you probably have never heard of before. He is a self-taught inventor who, among other things, has created a unit that enables cars, that's right, any car, to run on water. That's exactly what I said, water. Now, he's concealed his identity prior to this interview with Live at 7. However, our producer Samuel Gordon now exclusively introduces the world to Harlow, Maine. You would probably have seen him in the street and walked straight past him. Well, probably you might have noticed his height, but not much more. He pretty much resembles your average Jamaican. You might even have seen him driving past in the line of traffic and would not have realized that his car has not been to a gas station in many months and his gas needle is always on E. That alone makes him far above average. This latest invention of Harlow Maine was first brought to the public's attention when CVMTV's Newswatch carried this story. You have heard it often, cars don't run on water. Well, what did they do? One man has shown CVM a prototype of a device that can power vehicles not by hydrocarbons but by H2O. Nika Lewis looks at what is driving one Jamaican to innovate. He can turn water into gas. Gas for cars, that is. Inventor and research developer Harlow Main is the brain behind the Mainex H2 flex machine which he says is the answer to our gasoline woes. The technology which seeks to extract hydrogen gas from substances such as water and pee, among others, is gaining attention on the international scene as an alternative to the unpredictable gas prices and a resource many fear is on the verge of depletion. He has been working with scientists in California and China for the past five years, but has not abandoned his Jamaican roots as he filters his research home. He tells us how his latest invention can help revolutionize the gas markets. The unit in the back convert water, aluminum, and lye, which is caustic soda, mm -hmm. into hydrogen gas on demand. The hydrogen gas travel up into the fuel intake, the intake manifold of the engine, where it is combusted, power in the vehicle giving you 130 octane, more power, more speed, and it also cleans the engine. The gas meter on E, he explained how he has been using the device to drive for hours before refilling with either clean or dirty water. So what prompted this mystery man to work for five years on this project? We had to find out more about the enigma that is Harlow, Maine. Not only how we wanted to know, but also why did he get started in the first place? Harlow thought that the first thing we should talk about is peak oil. What is peak oil? It took nature about five million years to create the fossil fuels that the world consumes in one year. The modern way of life is dependent on this fossilized sunlight, although a surprising number of people take it for granted. Since 1860, Geologists have discovered over 2 trillion barrels of oil. Since then, the world has used approximately half. Before you can pump oil, you have to discover it. At first, it was easy to find and cheap to extract. The first great American oil field was Spindletop, discovered in 1900. Many more followed. Geologists scoured America. They found enormous deposits of oil, natural gas, and coal. America produced more oil than any other country, enabling it to become an industrial superpower. Once an oil well starts producing oil, it's only a matter of time before it enters a decline. Individual wells have different production rates. When many wells are averaged together, the combined graph looks like a bell curve. Typically, it takes 40 years after the peak of discovery for a country to reach its peak of production. 
after which it enters a permanent fall. In the 1950s, Shell geophysicist M. King Hubbard predicted that America's oil production would peak in 1970, 40 years after the peak of US oil discovery. Few believed him. However, in 1970, American oil production peaked and entered a permanent decline. So if your demand goes to 110 million barrels of oil, you're not going to find the supply because the supply peaked. Then after um, the peak, then there's a decline. The recession that impacted the United States economy and by extension the world in recent years was blamed on the real estate market. But that doesn't make much sense to Harlemagne. He believes peak oil to be the real reason. They did not blame it on oil, but oil was the sole factor for that um, um, recession. It was more than a recession, it was actually a depression. It was the worst since the Great Depression of the 1930s. And that was caused solely by peak oil. It was about $80, $80 a barrel and it went up to $150 a barrel. And at that point, um, the gas price went up in the United States to about $3 a gallon um, from around $180 something dollars a gallon. And the food price went up as well because whenever there's gas price um, spike, there's also a food price spike because you have tractor trailers and ships that need to transport food to your supermarket. Um, they need oil and gas, right? Their ship need bunker fuel, tractor trailer need diesel, and your vehicle to bring you to the supermarket or the taxi, they need gasoline. Um, those came from oil. Without oil, that's not possible. He explained to us what research led him to the invention he has created today. In my research, I noticed 60% of the oil we use, our energy we use from oil, goes into transportation. So I said, well, wind turbine is not going to um, help in that situation because transportation is very important uh, to bring produce from, say, the farm to the supermarket shelves, we need something more than windmill, wind energy. Um, I know these people are developing battery electric cars. That the, the problem with that is that the car need hours to eight hours or so to ch recharge. So that would be a lot of productivity lost there in time waiting for a battery to ch recharge. So I said there must be a better way. So I looked at um, hydrogen gas. I went back into a research that I was looking into. And I saw that they have fuel cell, but fuel cell is very, very expensive because they use expensive uh, materials such as gold and uh, platinum, you know, to make the fuel cell. And it's not long lasting. So. I try to see if I can come up with a better technology for the transportation industry. And that process continued. And that led me to um, come up with a, a system that uses electrolysis. That means you put electrode in water, two electrode in any water, connect it to a power source, and you'll get hydrogen gas to power your vehicle. The problem with that is that we are only moving power from, say, a car alternator and battery to the car combustion system, to the car gas fuel system. So you're moving power from one place to the next. It's still on some cars today in Jamaica here. Um, it was it was hard to see the savings. A person have to be driving all day, They're like a taxi operator, in order to see the savings. All you see was some, some increased power, but not much in savings. So, um, and the product was expensive to make because I used um, stainless steel to make the, uh, the unit. The examples that inspired him were of such that they used power to extract 
power. This boasted some savings, but still was not solving the problem that Harlow saw looming overhead. He probed deeper. I went, I went and started research in um, using a chemical reaction and looked around at several metals and silicon and found out that aluminum got the same amount of um, energy as oil. But is aluminum a renewable energy resource? I looked deeply into aluminum, found that it's renewable. Once you use aluminum, it turns into alumina, which can be smelt back into aluminum without end. So it is renewable? It's not really cheap. It takes a lot of energy. However, the aluminum that we use today are mostly, mostly smelted at near a dam. When powering, um, when smelting aluminum, we use renewable energy sources. Well, not me per se, but that's what is used um, today and has been used for over some 50 years. They use um, um, Overdam, which is, um, uh, what do you call those places? And Ni Niagara Falls, um, which is um, a renewable source. Um, hydroelectricity, for instance, to smelt alumina into aluminum. So it is renewable. So how unique is this technology anyway? People have tried that in, in many labs and many universities, but they never went as far as I did, as far as putting that into a product that's useful. We asked Harlemain to reveal the hidden secrets of his device. So I found out that water will eat aluminum, and water is H2O. When it eats aluminum, you get H2 from water, which is hydrogen. The O is kept back, which is oxygen. That's kept back into the aluminum, or the alumina as it's melted. Um, once I know that, I combine water use some kind of il uh, electrolyte, which I call lye or caustic soda, put in the water to remove the shiny protected coating on the aluminum itself. Once the protective coating has been removed, what we got is um, the water eating the aluminum, creating huge amount of hydrogen gas, and that comes out at high pressure, about 250 PSI. BMW are currently using this technology in one of the latest series of hybrid vehicles. However, there are a handful of gas stations in the United States and Europe that may supply cars with hydrogen gas, which is what is produced by topping up with water. But Harlow Main has made a product as opposed to a car. This product can be placed in any car and enable it to run on water. So how long does it take to install? It can be installed within 10 minutes. Uh, simple as um, just put it, put it in, in your intake manifold or connect it with a T connector to your fuel line and you're done. Talk of new technology is always exciting, but just how safe is this product? If you put aluminum, um, caustic soda or lye, and water together into a closed container, you will have some kind of um, pressure build up. And without nothing to stop that pressure, it's going to continue build and build until the, the unit breaks apart or even exploded. Um, the explosion that I noticed did not amount to anything quite dangerous. It can be. Uh, um, any explosion can be dangerous. I do watch these explosions before and it was dangerous to me. Not that it's not dangerous. Um, the, the explosion usually never result in any fire because it's water. And what of its approval on the international market? Yes, Live at 7 asked all the questions you're thinking of. Well, we currently we currently dealing with the Scientific Research Council um, as far as um, working with them to see how we can get this product um, up to 
up to the level of um, international safety. Um, so we're going to have to give them one unit for um, testing. Okay. Right. Um, That's going to be happening shortly? Yes, that should happen soon. We also will be sending uh, one of the product to the consumer elect uh, el electronics uh, company in, the U in, in Europe and one also to the, you know, the underwriters laboratory, which is UL, for approval. And we have spoken with them, and they, they like the technology, and they're willing to approve it after they did their own sef um, safety tests. And the patent has been approved? Basically. The patent has recently been approved, yes. Okay. Right, so it's no longer patent pen pending, but patented. Okay, so now on to the big one. Just how much savings will this device actually yield? It's not free. And yes, it runs on water, but it also requires an aluminium cartridge which would have to be purchased. At what cost? We try to maintain the cost, a cost of around 850 US, and not no more than that. For the unit? For, for each unit, right. The cartridge itself will keep the cartridge price of um, under 20 US dollars, which is under $2,000. They also, people also want to know um, the distance, the range that you can travel with this unit. And I will tell them it's based on the size of the vehicle and the weight of the vehicle, the size of the engine. So there's a lot of factor involved there. For instance, a 2,000 pound car, which is a small car, can travel 300 miles or 600 kilo kilometers um, on a single tank with a single cartridge, a two-pound cartridge, which is one kilogram. It could travel up to 300 miles on that. And that's like going from Kingston to Montego Bay and back to Kingston again before you need to change a cartridge. And at what cost? At two under $2,000. I would say in the neighborhood of around um, 1000 $700, Jamaican. Just how is the product catching on in the street? People are very excited about the technology. They want it like yesterday. They run up to us and always ask us when it's going to be available, when it's going to be ready. And we usually tell them uh, within a few months and I will let them know. Um, so people are very excited about it, extremely excited. Welcome back to Live at 7. Now, the technology, I'm sure, impressed our team as much as it's impressing you now. But we wanted to see the reaction of the general public to the technology. Live at 7 hit the streets with Harlow Main. So we're headed on the road with Harlow Main. Our final destinations, though varied, will involve stops at the workshops and garages of persons who have been integral in the development process that led to the creation of the H2 Flex. But en route, we journeyed through Halfway Tree. Harlow still had a lot to share with us about people's reaction to the technology. Yeah, of course, there's a lot of believers in it, but um, a vast majority of the population do not believe that the technology can work, and it's not by accident. You know, they have people yeah, putting out this information um, about the technology. And they usually use three things 
to this uh, discourage people from using these kind of technology. They show off the um, space shuttle Challenger that exploded in the air. Uh, they use hydrogen gas, um, but that technology uses compressed hydrogen gas. We don't use compressed hydrogen gas. Um, they sh also show the Hindenburg, which was a giant blimp back in the 1940s, I believe. Hydrogen is one of those things. People go, hydrogen, ooh, the Hindenburg, and they get all scared. Well, the Hindenburg did not blow up because of the hydrogen. The Hindenburg blew up because of the cellulose paint on the outside. But somehow these rumors persist. It caught fire and quickly burned, and a lot of people lost their lives. Uh, this technology, they use it to demonstrate the dangers, the danger of using hydrogen gas. Um, research, uh, research and study shows that hydrogen did not play a part in that fire. It was what was painted on the outside of that blimp. Harlow Maine is not the first inventor to get the shaft. As a matter of fact, the world's greatest inventors have gotten the rawest of deals. Ever heard of Nikola Tesla? But his strangest alleged invention was a worldwide free electricity system. With funding from J.P. Morgan, Tesla built a gigantic tower in Shoreham, New York and named it Wardenclyffe. J.P. Morgan hoped the Wardenclyffe Tower could provide wireless communication across the world. However, Tesla had other plans. The inventor reportedly wanted to build an energy system that used Earth as a conductor. If the project worked, anyone could have electricity by simply sticking a rod into the ground. Unfortunately, free electricity is not profitable. And this system could be incredibly dangerous for the global elite because it could profoundly change the energy industry. Imagine how different the world would be if society didn't need oil or coal to function. Could the current world powers maintain control? The problem with Nikola Tesla, he went beyond his technology, his new invention, and came up with wireless current. So you could wirelessly send free current all over the place and safely. Um, J.P. Morgan didn't like that, and somehow that was the end of Nikola Tesla. Tesla, by the way, invented light bulbs that had no filament so they could never burn out. He discovered a way to provide electricity wirelessly, and he also created alternating current which we use today. Why have you never heard of his light bulb with no filament that could never burn out? And why have you never heard of wireless electricity? That's because Tesla wanted his inventions to be free for all mankind to use for their betterment. The powers that be did not allow him to progress accordingly. He died a pauper. Is this the fate that will befall Harlow Maine? Um, another challenge that I met is um, funding, financing. Um, here in Jamaica, people do not like to finance local technology. The technology has to come from overseas or the technology has to be developed yeah, to a point where we don't no longer need financing. And then you'll see people running, coming up, want to prov provide that funding when it's um, no longer needed. But to get funding, to get the product to the um, consumer, that's very, very challenging. Well, I've been to several institutions. Um, I will not name any of them outright. And they, if, um, they love the technology, I could tell you that. But after they go into some kind of closed door meeting, then they come back and they put up some kind of barriers and say, listen, we need, they need collaterals when none was really needed or the collateral that I have is not up to par, you know. so. There and uh, some even give grants that they get from other countries to put in renewable energy technology. And when I go to those companies that um, institutions that provide the grants, they some of them will give me a run around. They, they love the technology, but after going to a closed door meeting and come out, um, their love for the technology somewhat changed. You know, still loving the technology, but no, no longer want to give the grants. Um, you know, um, I don't understand why. 
but it's a challenge even to get the money that was prov provided for this kind of um, technology. Right, still a challenge to this very day. This is not a joke. If the system can't suppress the inventor by keeping him poor, they pull out all the stops. But I have been trained, yes. Well, the patent has been granted, and so there's no longer any reason to hide my identity, uh, even though uh, that might be foolish on my part because the product is still not um, out there on the mass market and to keep such a, te te such a technology um, from the masses um, usually they want to do anything possible to um, suppress it uh, including um, threats and um, you know um, anything that they think would stop the technology. Well, it does make me feel good, I could tell you that. To know that um, your life has been threatened, you know, and to send, um, I didn't want to go into it, but they actually sent me explosive, um, um, saying this is a t um, aluminum shavings that could um, could work in the product, which it, it, it could if it's real aluminum shaving, but it was not real, and it's, it's actually explosive. So it was designed to um, blow me apart and blow the um, technology apart. And they were not su successful. And by the way, I still have that aluminum shavings. Uh, it did blow up, so I know what I'm talking about. And I still have them for testing. So it's available till this very day, right. The oil giants have amassed great wealth and will fight to keep it. There are wars over it, over oil in certain part of the world. Right now as we speak, people are dying to get that oil out the ground and bring to us. In, for instance, we, for, uh, we get our oil from Venezuela and there is unrest that's brewing in Venezuela as well. We saw that in every oil producing country. We get sun all the time, we get rain all the time, we get wind all the time. And these are things that have been given to us by God for us to live. So it is for us to, to create ways from these things to make, to make a living and for life to be easier for, for everyone. H2 Flex is the, is the thing to use. H2 Flex is the way to go. H2 Flex is the changer. H2 Flex is what will bring the change to the nation, to the world. H2 Flex will reduce crop poverty. There's no question about it. H2 Flex will increase wealth. I remember you know, it's ending taxi man and boss man say. That's how it goes, you know. Yeah, man. Why not spend money like we, you know, on the street? It's it's we have it. We have it, you know. We have it, you know. We have it, you know. Yeah, man. Yeah, we have it, you know. We have it, you know. So who really is this Hilo Maine and where on earth did he garner his talents? In this segment, we'll try and find out. Simon asked, but I'm going to ask again, who are you Hilo Maine? Please convince us you're not an alien. Tell us about your upbringing as a child. I was, born, I was born in Falmouth Hospital and I grew up partly in Trelawney and partly in the United States. Also, before I go to the United States, I also grew up in um, yeah, Vineyard Town, you know, spent some time there. And 
a few other places in Kingston here. And everybody was surprised that I was able to draw without nobody teaching me. Um, it just came naturally to me. I used to love drawing. I used to love drawing. Um, I'm always drawing planes and all kind of different kind of um, product that I saw. You know, cars, I draw that a lot, you know. But my drawing was kind of an abstract drawing, which I still do till this very day. But I've been doing that since I was um, around two. We asked if he had any mentors who guided him and or inspired him in his pursuits, and the answer was flatly, no. So when did this habit of inventing begin? That never faded. It never really increased either. My drawing is still with me today. We are draw products that looks like, you know, say for instance, a, a phone that I'm trying to come up with a new way of using it. I would draw the, the phone itself and then going into the background to try to find the chips, the, uh, the processors and so forth, how the phone's gonna look how it's going to handle, and so on and so forth. I still do that till this very day. I've been doing that since I was young, very young. He would play a few normal games as a child. However, his social interactions were divided between his beautiful mind and his human friends. Well, yes, I live a, a more seclusive life. Um, I was always by myself doing this kind of um, research and development. You know, I saw, I read a lot, I watch um, news a lot back then, you know, and try to find where problems are and how I could solve them. His school life in Jamaica only involved a basic school in Trelawney before he left the island. But even before he left Jamaica, his grandmother and his relatives noticed something strange. My grandmother, she was um, very excited at a early age. At, um, at an early stage in time, when I was around two, um, two, two years old, and she was surprised that I could draw something that detailed. In fact, it was a plane. She actually took that picture and framed it, that drawing, and framed it. The other family members were very surprised as well, as, uh, as far as my talent and the stuff I can do. You know, they were very supportive. Um, of my drawings because my drawings were actually unique and they were product drawings so it's they were always product that can put on the market. So what was his first invention? A peanut vending machine that when you go to the movie theater so you would see um, you would be able to buy a roasted peanut from a vending machine that's shaped like a peanut like a big peanut with eyes and mouth and you know, so right, I was doing the, the, those drawings as a teenager, and that was re, wasn't really a drawing. That those were um, invention work because that never existed and still doesn't exist till um, till this very day. There's no peanut vending machine, hot roasted peanut vending machine. Um, you can't find that except for the uncut person who pushed that vending machine with the whistle on it. Um, other from that. There's still, that technology still doesn't exist, except on paper, and I got the um, patent for that. From that moment, the floodgates opened up, and Harlow Maine never stopped inventing. If I picked up something, say like a toothbrush, and I did not like the way it feel in my hand, I would try to draw something better and try to make something better. So I always start out with the drawing and then try to um, carve it out of the wood or something to get the feel of it. And I did do so with the trifold toothbrush. That, that was when I was a teenager. I do have a battery technology, and the battery technology is a battery that cannot run out, cannot be um, as long as there's water. So I don't want to go into it deeply as yet because it tied into another invention that I currently have out. But this battery technology uh, would be able to run, say, um, a family of five, you know, a uh, family of four, um, for about a month. A house? A house, yes. Right. 
and it could also run uh, large buildings, you know, no matter the size of water. So it's a type of, it's a, it's an hydrogen battery, put it that way. Uh, right, so it will turn the water into electricity, uh, not unlike fuel cell. I don't know if you know a fuel cell, okay. but right, it's not unlike that. It's not very similar to it either. Okay, my, one of my first early product was, as I mentioned, the hot roasted peanut vending machine. Um, it was too, it was too technical at the time, too much electronics involved, and uh, it was very expensive to manufacture. Uh, another product was the toothbrush. The, it wasn't really a toothbrush, but it was a complete oral care set with um, tongue scraper, tartar scraper, dental mirror, floss, everything attached to that one um, um, case, which is also the handle. So uh, that was an early multi-purpose um, oral care kit that I came up with. It was um, actually 12 piece. Uh, nobody still have that on the market. Um, I also have a bristle, toothbrush bristles that instead of um, making them straight up, I crisscross them a little bit so they could get rid of plaques between the teeth. And that bristles uh, is on sale now by Oral-B, um, which is now owned by Gillette Company or some other company by the mouth, Procter & Gamble, I believe. He continued to design, wowing those around him as he went. It was um, a mop. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it properly, but it was um, designed to help senior citizen um, people who are handicapped or who are challenged, physically challenged, to help stay in the house and clean, you know, clean the house. So this mop would do the ringing automatically and so on and so forth. It does a lot of things. Um, that, yeah, by the press of a button. It was an electronic product, so it got a little motor in it and batteries and so forth. So when you press a button, it would um, ring out the water. It would also vibrate in the water to rinks. So there's nothing you, you have to do but put it in the water and press a button. So it would rinks and then ring by itself. Off camera at this point, Harlomain told us an incredible story about an extremely useful invention he had created which caused the highest planetary authorities to clamp down on his work. He would not allow us to share the grandness of the technology with our viewers. This is all he would say. Okay. Right, and I also have um, a technology which I can't mention about except that it was into the medical field. And uh, um, that was that was a challenge. <laughs> um, I can't speak much about that one. Um, Can you speak about its use? Um, no, I cannot. Okay. Um, I can't speak about it, the the use of it. I did what, went into serious. Is it now in use? No, it's not. Okay. Why is it that you can't speak about it? Um, can't speak about that either. Okay, will it be in use? Um, I don't know. Okay, are you are you in in talks with medical authorities and so on to have it approved for, for use? No, I got in trouble for it. So I got in serious trouble for that. So what kind of trouble? They were saying that you were making something that that had um, that could be used in a negative way. No could be used in a positive way. Right. Right. It could, uh, it could be used in, it would be used in a positive way, a very positive way, right. but it's, it's a disruptive technology. Right. And a disruptive technology is usually something that disrupt the way, right. disrupt the way how the medical field is run. And they don't want any of that. That's interesting. 
and this pressure that you received was from from whom? From what kind nah, of pressure? I won't say the kind of pressure are from whom, okay. but the pressure is there okay. and it's still there. His desire to find alternate sources of energy began before the water car. He thought that the lopsided design of common windmills, such as those at the Wigton Wind Farm, were inefficient and far too frail to handle the kinds of wind that would generate real power. And this one is um, a new kind of wind turbine, um, a powerful new wind turbine to um, alleviate this um, en energy crisis that's here in Jamaica. Um, it's still not an, um, it's still in development. And what would be so different about his turbine? Okay, it's very different because the current wind turbine they have now have to sit on a pole. And the pole can only withstand the, a certain weight of the wind turbine. And the wind turbine is um, usually a magnet generator, and they're very heavy. What we should be doing today, we, we, are, we have a different way of creating a wind turbine system without that pole. We could put windmill, for instance, on a large skyscraper. Um, I won't say more about the technology because it's not yet patented, you know, but my technology would be much more powerful than the current technology. Harlemagne is truly special and celebrated by the few people that know him. No, that's the excited part about it for me. The excited part for me is the Jamaican contribution to it because I'm so used to hearing of the bad news coming out of Jamaica and to see a news that has this global effect, it's, it's, it's excited. I'm excited about it. This guy is a self-taught, brilliant person, if you really boil it down to that, who has just sat there with material and educated himself and experimented and worked on this project and others, but this one for about five years. And it, and it has worked in the sense that <laughs> this man has now gotten a full patent from the United States Patent Office to produce this thing worldwide. And You know, it's not easy to raise support for creative ventures, especially those that impact other major industries. As a result, challenges are real. So too are death threats. What's the future for this powerful technology? Now, for the final segment, here, once again, is Samuel Gordon. Uh, you don't smell no pollution or not when you pass, you don't smell no pollution. So is it clean enough for me to put my nose down to it and smell it? Yeah man, it's clean enough you put your, your, your nose, it, not even your eye not burning or not when you put your, your face or your tailpipe, you don't I get no pollution from it. So this vehicle is now being revved, which means the exhaust is coming out at, wow, a much higher rate. It's pushing, it's actually pushing my hand away. And I'm told that this is clean. I'm told that I can put my nose right down and inhale everything that comes out of this vehicle as it is water vapor. I'm gonna try. No, I won't deny it is slightly warm, but it is as fresh as the air that I am breathing right now. This vehicle is a new step. This is a new day. It is indeed a new day. Our team caught up with co-founder of Cure, Richard Dickey Crawford, to get his perspective on this new technology. Incidentally, Crawford had already been contacted by Harlow Main and was integrally involved in assisting him in the process of gaining funding for the valuable project. 
Minister Hilton, as well as Minister Philip Paulwell, endorsed the project and gave their strong support that if all of the particulars that are required by the bank can be satisfied, they would love to see the project go ahead. He also went to the Scientific Research Council, um, and that's a good place to have gone to. And the SRC, we spoke to them as well, and I think that they have positively responded with a grant to him to get his program moving. I don't think we are at the point where we can say everything has been 100% complete and everything is in place. But I think we are at a point where we can say thanks to Development Bank of Jamaica, thanks to Paul Well, thanks to Tony Hilton, thanks to Scientific Research Council. And if it goes the way I'm thinking and hoping it will go, then I think we have a win on our hands. Wow. Well, we surely did not expect that news. And Live at 7 will be following up to find out whether or not Maine will receive the support that is being promised to him. But we still wanted to ask Mr. Crawford why new technology and creative industries in Jamaica don't get more support. He had an anecdote for us. Some time ago, somebody came to me and said, listen, I have a, I have a product here that can cut down the, the cost of JUTC using diesel and, and the cost to the company, its operating costs. So can you get me a meeting to see if I can get through to the company? And, and he got the runaround for the longest while possible, you know? So sometimes vested interests always block people, young people, entrepreneurs, inventors, people who want to change. And um, this thing has the potential to be a multi-million dollar enterprise for Harlow and his team. And um, it also has the possibility of changing the equation in the energy industry and all like that. Crawford also confirmed our worst fears about politics in Jamaica. People don't like to take chances on long-term development. They want to win the next election. So you always delay fixing the water supply. You delay solar energy because next thing the election come and you're in the middle and you don't get the quiz and you get voted out. So that's what is confronting us. Crawford, however, has been thoroughly impressed by the work ethic and attitude of Harlow, Maine. You have a, we have our legend, Bob Marley, Usain Bolt. You have a Harlow, Maine over in that side in science and technology. I, I just don't know where this guy came from. I mean, to be very frank with you, in the interviews um, with one of the banks, every recommendation that was made by the bankers, you know, he just responded positively. You never got the thing, well, this is mine, I invent it, and therefore, he said, no, 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 well, if that can work, I will, I'll go back to the drawing board and come back to you. And as for peak oil, does Dickie believe that it's just another myth, or is it real? In Dubai and everywhere else, I mean, in all the oil-rich countries, when you see oil-rich kingdoms shift into solar power, you know something is up. So they have all the oil, they have all the money in the world, but they know the oil is going to finish within a certain period of time. So they are making alternative energy provisions, and, and that says a lot. Everybody knows it's going to happen, and therefore anything that can reduce the consumption of oil will prolong the supply, number one, and anything that can reduce the cost is going to be useful for everybody. The Dubai Supreme Council of Energy unveiled the Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum Solar Park at the World Future Energy Forum in Abu Dhabi. The park is one of the first major initiatives of the council and is expected to generate 1,000 megawatts of power. In our travels with Harlow, Maine, we also met the owner of the vehicle in which the Mainex prototype has been installed. Oh. Whether I'm running to the bank, when I'm running to a job, whatever it is, recreational, whatever it is, I, am, I, I have a peace of mind. I don't have to worry about not having any cash in my pocket to buy gas. All I have to do is to just ensure that I have adequate water and I can take on the world. I've been driving with my, with my tongue on E for quite a while. As you can see, not just now, not just today, not just yesterday, the day before, and the day before, and the day before, my needle remains 
where it is. When you're driving a vehicle and you and you see your gas light, your gas gauge keep producing, and you know you have not accomplished that you need to, and you do not have cash to further put gas in your car, it can be very scary. It can be very scary if you're running out of gas at any point on, while you're on the road. To have a vehicle that is operated by water, it removes it removes that fear. Because as Jamaican, we are such a warm set of people that you can stop anywhere along the road and ask someone for a jug of water and they will assist you. Our journeys carried us to the technician who assisted Harlow in figuring out how to compress and contain the hydrogen gas to make the product safe. He too is an inventor in his own right. Well, I meet him too. I thought it bad, which I'm a bad technician. Uh, what we learned, I'm not, I don't all there's really work for them, whether camera, TV, VCR, computer, whatever. I make the, the impossible happen for them. So what I'm not now, he came to me saying that they buying this model from China and it has been this damaging every time they, them, them assembly it, it broke down it damage. So with that now, he asked me to intervene. When I check it, the, the source was in, improper. So I had to configure it for it to perform in the appropriate way. Yeah, because it was costing a few thousand dollars as well. Because it was got the repair pass for it and again and again and again and again. So they brought it to me and I'm in that fault. Just not seeing it, believing what they would have to test it. They would have to try it. And I think nothing, this thing would be passed by the Bureau of Standard to be safe. Regulation to be safe. So with every new in, with, with every new every, every new development, all these products are tested and passed. So they 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 don't be fear of fear of it might cause any cause of harm in any way to them. In no way it'll be a safe thing. And finally, on our way back to CVM Studios, we took a trip to Jagas, the German automotive school, where we came across yet another member of Hilo's organically created team, this time a chemist. Well, actually it was one night um, going home, a friend called me to, for him to explain it to me because he needed some assistance. So when he explained it to me, well actually he explained the reaction first, and actually I actually formulated that chemical formula for for the for the reaction instantaneously so you're seeing that hey you know that you are you are the right person for this for 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 assisting me so I'm saying okay so the other day I went to his home and he showed me it and I'm saying okay because it's so straightforward to me because I'm a chemistry person so it's like fixing a puzzle a picture puzzle so it, it was so simple and then well actually at first we came in contact with a minor problem in which because the reaction takes place with the main ingredient which is aluminum and the metal in which he had was not aluminum. So I had to state that this was not aluminum. So we had to take that out of the equation and get aluminum and after that everything is A-OK. -okay. The crowd gathered as we conducted our interview. Mr. Phillips, a senior instructor at the German Automotive School, was blown away. You know, this blow my mind, just blow my mind knowing that, you know, I can use water to drive my car around and we can use this to do a lot more because they say you can cook with it, you can operate other things with it, um, you cannot run your house with it. So, I mean, this is the next level. Students were equally as excited and encouraged by the visit of Harlow, Maine to the automotive school. Well, I would definitely would like to see the energy minister putting a little bit more funding in technology like this. This would benefit Jamaica and put us a little bit further on the market. And we'd probably take a step further into where we need to go in the future. As the crowd gathered, even the police joined in on the action. They engaged the Mainex team with great excitement. They didn't want us to show their faces on camera, but they were on location for over 10 minutes asking questions. This product will, 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 will make Jamaicans not even want thief light again. Because every man can have a unit. The more units that are sold, the cheaper the units become. And persons can have their own unit because this unit has the, has the capacity to produce electricity as well. In the same form that it is, it can produce electricity. So, 
a man who doesn't have a thief light in the morning, he can cook up his own light off his unit using water and, and, and running it and paying for this light bill. And how do we end a feature like this? With hope, with anticipation and with joy that the future of Jamaica is bright. Here's to another great Jamaican in the person of Harlow, Maine. This can happen this year where we don't have enough petrol, we don't have enough fuel for our transportation. To avoid this from happening, people can um, go to Mainix and sign up and where we can see there's a demand for it and we'll put the product into production. In fact, we'll be able to pressure the banks to show them that there's real demand. People actually need this technology. And if we can show these numbers, then the bank would be real, uh, willing to lend us these um, um, funds that we need to manufacture the product. All right, that's it for Live at uh, 7 this evening. We're off to enjoy the celebrations of our nation's birth, but we return on Thursday with all new programming. So on behalf of our entire hardworking production team, thank you so much for watching. Do join me again on Thursday, Live at 7.